Growth in developing Asia remains resilient, and the outlook is improving. The region's outlook has been boosted in large part by the decision of the People's Republic of China to end its zero COVID policy. Consumption and investment continue to grow as economic reopening continues throughout the region. As restrictions are eased, many people are starting to travel for work and leisure. This is boosting tourism revenue and remittances. The region's reopening helps offset several ongoing challenges. The Russian invasion of Ukraine will keep food and energy prices elevated. Global financial conditions may remain tight, slowing external demand and raising financial stability risks. According to ADB's latest forecast, economies in developing Asia will grow 4.8% this year and next year. This is up from 4.2% growth in 2022. With reopening from COVID-19 in full swing, the People's Republic of China is projected to grow by 5.0% in 2023 and 4.5% in 2024. India, South Asia's largest economy, is projected to grow 6.4% this year and 6.7% next year amid healthy domestic demand. Inflation in developing Asia is forecast to slow to 4.2% this year and 3.3% next year, compared with 4.4% in 2022. To sustain the region's recovery, it's important that policymakers work together to support trade openness and lower barriers to investment and productivity. The region must also be vigilant against financial risks and strengthen policies to safeguard financial stability. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation of the Asian Development Outlook 2023. My name is Abdullah Biad. I'm Director of Macroeconomic Research at the ADB, and I'll start by giving a 15-minute presentation summarizing the Outlook Report, which was launched today. This will be followed by a panel discussion and open question and answer where you can post your questions uh, and our, our, panel, our panelists will answer them. So you'll see that we have a relatively optimistic subtitle for our report, Brighter Prospects Amid Ongoing Challenges. So let me summarize the key messages from the report. So first, we expect the PRC's reopening. This is the People's Republic of China. We expect the People's Republic of China's reopening to improve growth and regional prospects compared to last year. Second, the rebound in manufacturing and exports gradually Gradually weakened late last year as activity in advanced economies softened, but more recent business indicators show signs of improvement this year. Third, the PRC's recovery and healthy domestic demand in the region will support growth this year and next year. Growth in developing Asia is projected to rise from 4.2% last year to 4.8% both this year and next year. Fourth, as supply pressures have faded, Inflation is projected to decline from 4.4% last year to 4.2% this year and 3.3% next year, coming down toward pre-pandemic levels. Fifth, the upside risk that the PRC's reopening could be even stronger is uh, one thing we highlight in the report. But other challenges remain, including policy tightening in advanced economies, heightened financial stability risks, and the evolution of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So let me spend some time to walk you through these points and, pro and provide additional detail. This chart shows the contribution to half-year growth rates in 2022 for 10 regional developing economies with quarterly data. These together account for about 90% of the region's GDP. There are two key takeaways from this chart. The first is that net exports declined in key tech exporters, including in the Republic of Korea, Singapore, and Taipei, China. This is shown by the orange bars in the bar chart, and those countries are in the middle. The decline was due to a weaker global outlook, but also due to a rotation in demand away from goods and towards services and weakness in the global semiconductor market. 
The second point is that growth was strong last year in the ASEAN economies, the Southeast Asian economies. And here you can see Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and the Philippines on the right. In these countries, growth in the second half of last year was driven by consumption, shown in green bars, and investment, shown in the blue bars. Manufacturing production recovered strongly early last year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Manufacturing production recovered strongly early last year. However, this trend weakened in the second half of the year due to declining external demand. The left-hand side chart shows year-on-year -year growth in industrial production for key manufacturing exporters other than the People's Republic of China. And it shows a decline in growth since the fourth quarter of 2022. The right-hand side table shows the purchasing manager index colored in green when the data indicates improvement and red when there's a decline. You can see that PMIs worsened between the last quarter of 2022 and January for a number of key exporters. Give me one second, <laughs> just, uh, there you go. For a number of key exporters shown in the lower half of the table. However, the latest readings from February and in the March data released yesterday indicate improvement in manufacturing for a broader set of economies. Next slide, please. Good. The merchandise export data broadly reflects weaker external demand in the second half of last year. Tourism, on the other hand, continues to recover. The left-hand side chart shows nominal merchandise exports for the PRC in red, for key tech exporters in green, and developing Asia, excluding the PRC in blue. You can see that they all dropped in late 2022, especially the key technology exporters, although this is following a very strong recovery in the previous year. The right-hand side chart shows visitor arrivals by subregion. Tourism strongly recovered across the region last year, and it's, it's on track to return to pre-pandemic levels in most subregions this year, thanks in part to the PRC's reopening. Next slide, please. Financial conditions improved starting in November last year, but tightened again this February and March. The left-hand side chart shows the orange line, which is the VIX index, and it's a measure of market volatility and, or uncertainty. Um, and that declined from November last year, reflecting uh, in, in large part a, a less hawkish stance by the US Federal Reserve. At the same time, the blue line shows that equity markets in developing Asia went up from November on improved, November, on improved sentiment of equity investors. However, the easing of financial conditions lost momentum since February. This was due to renewed uncertainty over the pace of monetary tightening by the Fed due to continued inflationary pressures in the US, and then in March on concern over the banking system in both the US and Europe. The right-hand side chart shows exchange rate movements of regional currencies. The blue bars show large depreciations from January to September 2022, often 10% or more. But the green bars show that since October last year until March of this year, more than half of the currencies have appreciated. Next slide, please. With respect to fiscal positions, the left-hand side chart shows changes in fiscal balances from the previous year. So the green dots are the changes in fiscal balances from 2021 to 2022, and the orange triangles are the expected changes from 2022 to 2023. Last year, in many countries, fiscal deficits widened, as can be seen by you know, about half of the green dots being on the left side of the chart. This year, though, we expect fiscal positions to improve, as shown by the orange triangles mostly being on the right side of the chart. This is because tax revenues are recovering with economic growth and spending related to the pandemic is declining. With regard to monetary policy, the right-hand side chart shows the direction of policy interest rate decisions by central banks, with red being hikes, blue being holds, and green being cuts. Last year, the majority of rate decisions in the region were hikes, and those hikes averaged 86 basis points. 
Policy tightening since then has eased in recent months, with inflation slowing down in the region and also because of less aggressive Fed tightening. Most decisions have been to keep interest rates unchanged, about two-thirds of uh, rate decisions so far this year. And the magnitudes of the hikes, when they did occur, has become much smaller. Next slide, please. We expect the global headwinds that constrained growth in developing Asia last year to continue this year. The left chart shows that monetary policy will likely remain tight in advanced economies. This will dent growth in the euro area and in the US this year. We expect both economies to grow by less than 1%. The middle chart shows that oil and gas prices will likely remain high as EU sanctions on Russia further tightened in December and January. And the right chart shows that food prices also will likely remain high this year, although less than last year. Next slide, please. Thank you. The PRC's reopening is expected to improve growth in that country compared to last year, and also to boost regional prospects through trade and other linkages. The left chart shows that since the PRC abandoned its zero COVID policy in December, the number of sub subway passengers has already exceeded pre-pandemic levels. This suggests domestic mobility in the PRC has returned to normal. The right chart shows that the rebound in the PRC varies across manufacturing, services, and construction. The red line shows that services are seeing the largest boost, driven by contact-intensive sectors such as hospitality, leisure, and transport. Manufacturing also rebounded as supply chain issues resolved after the lockdown ended. We expect the growth in the PRC will accelerate from 3% last year to 5% this year, and then 4.5% next year. The 5% growth forecast is 0.7 percentage points higher than the forecast we made before China ended its zero COVID policy. Next slide, good. We expect growth in all subregions to normalize, but the outlook does vary across subregions and economies. In the Caucasus and Central Asia, we expect growth to slow down after strong performance following the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year. So it was quite surprising. And in fact, this, re this report has a special topic section that does a deep dive into the reasons for this unexpectedly good performance. In East Asia, we expect growth to accelerate, driven primarily by that faster growth in the PRC. We forecast growth to slow in the Republic of Korea and in Taipei, China, on falling demand for electronics. South Asia will remain the best performing region, subregion this year, driven by robust growth in India, which, we, uh, which should register high growth both this year and next year. In contrast, we forecast growth to slow in Pakistan, and we forecast a contraction in Sri Lanka. For Southeast Asia, growth will normalize as weak global demand weighs on exports and despite a slight boost from tourism. So you have that strong domestic demand that we saw earlier and a boost to tourism offsetting the weaker global demand. Lastly, in the Pacific, lower commodity prices will weigh on growth in Papua New Guinea, while the reopening of alternative tourism destinations will slow the expansion in Fiji. In the rest of the Pacific, growth will actually turn positive for the first time after three years of contraction, supported by resuming tourism and infrastructure projects. Next slide, please. Regional inflation is expected to come down after peaking in the second half of last year, as shown in the left chart. Next year, it'll fall back close to pre-pandemic levels. The slowdown in advanced economies will lower price pressures globally, and domestic inflation expectations in the PRC remain well anchored. In South Asia and Southeast Asia, inflation is expected to decline slightly this year. In the Caucasus and Central Asia, inflation will slow on easing supply chain constraints and falling commodity prices. Let me close by flagging the key upside and downside risks to the outlook. The PRC's reopening could generate a stronger than expected rebound of domestic consumption, which would have positive regional spillovers through trade and tourism. Second, slower than expected disinflation in advanced economies would push authorities to a more hawkish policy stance. Third, higher interest rates 
could expose vulnerabilities from higher debt levels. So financial stability risks could undermine the growth outlook. Fourth, the Russian invasion of Ukraine could escalate further, renewing food and energy security challenges. And lastly, there are other medium-term challenges, including the fracturing of global production, which could affect trade, employment, and productivity, and also challenges related to climate change, including more frequent extreme weather events and the transition to net zero, which is the topic of our thematic report, which will be launched on April 27. So let me end my presentation here and pass on to my colleague, Madhavi Pandit, who will be moderating the session. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul, for presenting the key messages of the Asian Development Outlook 2023. Hello, everyone. My name is Madhavi Pandit, and I will moderate the panel discussion where we can delve further into the macroeconomic outlook, risks, and policies in the region. Join me today in welcoming three colleagues from the regional departments, Akiko Terada Hagiwara, Principal Country Specialist, East Asia, Thiam Hinang or Bernard, Director, South Asia, James Villaferte, Principal Economist, Southeast Asia, and from the Economics Research Department, Senior Economist, Yotin Jinjarak. A big welcome to our audience. We have close to 190 participants today, and I'm sure you have many questions uh, for this discussion. The audience can post their questions in the Q&A box and also click the like icon for questions you want to hear more about, and I will raise them with our panelists. So let's begin with a question for Akiko on one of the key messages in the presentation on the People's Republic of China. ADB's forecast for PRC growth this year is 5%, which is lower than IMF's January forecast of 5.2%, and other forecasts from the private sector, some of which are above 5.5%. Can you comment a little bit about what's behind this difference? Um, thank you, Madhavi. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Akiko Hagiwara uh, in Beijing office. So um, thank you for that question. Uh, let me just uh, begin by saying that our ADU outlook for China is essentially um, similar to the IMF's uh, uh, outlook in terms of trajectory, uh, saying that uh, we do expect a recovery this year uh, before moderating uh, somewhat in the next year. Um, we are optimistic but we are also cautiously optimistic. Uh, I tell you why, because um, I see outside traffic is back, metro is full of people and the economic activities are actually uh, resuming. Uh, it's, uh, we are very upbeat on that. But at the same time, we are aware that the labor market is not yet fully back. Um, we know that the external development uh, demand is not may not be as strong as uh, previous years. So those uh, put us uh, in somewhat uh, cautious side uh, for this um, 2023. And um, having said that, uh, we do see some positive development in terms of um, supporting uh, small businesses and real estate sector uh, from the policy side. So um, as Abdul said, there might be um, upside risk also. So um, this is the thinking behind our outlook. Over to you, Madani. Thank you, Akiko. In contrast to most other subregions, uh, the presentation showed that South Asia has the highest growth expected. Let me uh, bring Bernard in and ask him to throw a little more light on what are the drivers of growth in South Asia. Thank you so much, Manavi. So I think uh, South Asia has you know, recovered strongly from the impact of the pandemic. And actually, most of the growth is sort of, in a sense, normalizing. Uh, South Asia uh, has you know, lower incomes. A lot of the growth we see here is uh, catching up. Uh, recently, we've seen that there's a lot of uh, more optimism uh, driven by you know, improvement in the services sector, the strong demand in the services. At the same time, we see that the countries are investing a lot in new infrastructure. Uh, to sort of uh, uh, you know, improve the, sort of the, the growth of the economy there. 
And we are also seeing a greater openness to sort of the global uh, market in the South Asia region. At the same time, you know, while we normally when we talk about the forecast for the whole region, we talk about the largest economy, India, you know, really has been, you know, mobilizing a lot for investment, uh, getting ready a lot for the, you know, investing a lot in the transition to uh, cleaner energy and so on. But we should not forget the small economy, which has also benefited from the recovery uh, in the tourism. So Maldives basically has more or less uh, got back to this uh, level of tourism pre-pandemic, and it should further uh, benefit from the new tourists that are coming in from uh, China, which has just recently uh, reopened. That said, of course, we also have uh, you know uh, Sri Lanka, which of course have been through a very difficult uh, period. Uh, as he sort of uh, tried to grapple with this uh, burden of uh, debt. Uh, that said, we also have some sort of, uh, how should we say, glimmer of hope, a chance for a better tomorrow with the sort of the conclusion of, uh, with the approval of the IMF program, which will sort of further unlock further uh, funding from other uh, multilateral agency, plus, of course, the fruits of the reform that they already started to undertake. I'll just stop here. Thank you, Bernard. You did touch upon uh, debt levels, and we can come back to this discussion later. But let's talk a little bit about Southeast Asia first. Uh, James, while Southeast Asia has seen robust recovery in the last two years, what are the prospects, let's say, in the next two years? And what policies will be critical for the region to cope with these challenges? Thank you, Madami. And and first, congratulations to the ADO team for a successful launch. Um, as you can see, the Southeast Asia region is really normalizing. In the next two years, we expect growth to be around 4.7% next year, this year and five next year. This is still way below the 10-year average pre-pandemic, which is around 5.7%. We expect that uh, slowly uh, growth in the region will approach uh, the trend, trend growth. Uh, although in output terms, we expect that the level of output in the region would probably still be about 8% below. The main risk that the region is facing is really external shocks coming from outside, in particular tightening monetary policy, inflation rate, and increasing uh, bank stress in, in the U.S., which is a big concern. And here, I think the most important policy response to, for the region is actually a uh, a, a, a policy mix, a balanced policy mix. So, so the main constraint that the region is facing is high interest rate and inflation, which tends to lower growth. But the, the main problem with increasing interest rate is that it can also uh, put a heavy burden on firms and households and actually can compromise uh, financial stability. Thus, I think the region needs to be very cautious. They need to use financial policy like macroprudential policies to ensure that financial system remains to be viable despite all these global shocks. I think the other important policy of the region is really to continue to undertake domestic reforms that actually enhances the growth potential and growth drivers in the region. And here I think I can identify three things. One is reform to really focus on the uh, revamp of tourism so that it becomes an anchor for recovery. So enhancing information sharing, uh, standardizing travel protocol, uh, adapting digital technology and increasing digital skills of tourism workers would be useful. The other aspect which is quite important as well is agro-processing and increasing agricultural productivity. And you've mentioned the impact of uh, climate change on, for example, food security. I think here we need to improve product standards. We need to enhance the supply chain in agriculture. Like for example, in, in the Philippines, a few months ago, we had problems with uh, onions and prices of onions went, went up. So this is another area that, that needs support. I think the last one that I, I think is also a growth driver is trade in services. We know that uh, during the pandemic, e-commerce is really ramped up. And there are so many policies like enhancing connectivity, soft connectivity, improving um, logistics, as well as transport connectivity, and also rolling out smart regulations. So, so these are the challenge for the region is to to undertake this three critical reform of balancing policy mix. Uh, second is enhancing um, growth drivers and the, the, the sources of new growth drivers. And I think last but not the least is also managing climate change. So I'll stop here, Madhavi, and back to you. Thank you, James. 
Um, I want to briefly touch upon another aspect of the presentation before we move on to some of the questions here. Uh, Yotin, could you come in a little bit on one of the very interesting slides that talked about key technology exporters and perhaps expand a little bit on the performance drivers? Thanks, Madhavi. Um, well, this question is very fitting with my location. <laughs> I'm uh, joining from uh, Seoul, uh, South Korea. So the, regarding the performance the, of uh, key technology exporter in the region, um, uh, this include, uh, as the Abdul pointed out earlier, uh, Singapore, uh, South Korea, and uh, Taipei, China. Uh, we expect the recovery to happen later this year or early next year. Um, now, these economies, the, as also uh, uh, shown earlier in, in, in the chart, uh, you may recall that um, uh, the growth uh, uh, start slowing down um, since the mid-2021. Uh, the, the export of uh, and the production of uh, uh, those economies the, uh, uh, has already uh, start uh, uh, slowing down. Um, and then the, if you look at the industrial production, right? Um, the industrial production of uh, this key technology exporter um, uh, start uh, to decline uh, in August last year. Um, at the same time, if you look at the forward-looking indicators, the purchasing power, uh, purchasing manager index, right? Um, that I would also show earlier. Um, and we also noticed that, that this forward-looking indicator also show that um, um, uh, things are not uh, improving yet, right? Um, uh, so now, if 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 you look at the uh, semiconductor uh, in particular, um, we would. Uh, uh, Recall that the uh, uh, semiconductor uh, markets uh, is the, uh, having its own cycles, right? Um, and uh, this cycle uh, typically lasts uh, twenty to twenty-five months. Now, the the last cycle uh, start coming down uh, from uh, mid twenty twenty-one, right? Um, now, if we follow that cycles, the, this the pattern of cycles, it means that uh, later this year or early next year. Uh, the semiconductor market globally would start uh, re recovering. Uh, but it also means um, differently uh, for different countries, depending on the, the, their market segments. Uh, some countries like uh, Taipei, China, or uh, Korea, or Singapore, um, if you look at the, across the spectrum of uh, technology, they are at the high end. Right? Um, but uh, if you are uh, thinking about, say, Malaysia and Thailand, uh, they are at the lower end of uh, technology spectrum. Um, so the, the, the uptick in the uh, uh, semiconductor cycle uh, will mean uh, different things for different countries, uh, depending on uh, which segment uh, they are in. But yes, uh, we, we expect this uh, uh, market, uh, this sector uh, to recover, which would uh, help the, the key technology exporters. And looking at the long run, um, uh, there are several key the global trends uh, that, that should help support uh, this recovery. Uh, if you think about the uh, electric vehicles, um, the EVs, um, uh, the demand uh, uh, is growing uh, globally, um, and uh, the need for the wireless uh, communication, uh, high computing, uh, cloud computing the, uh, services, all this will require the semiconductors. Um, so in, in, in the longer term, uh, I think the, uh, the recovery should, should, should be coming soon um, for the key technology exporter in our region. Let me stop here and uh, take other questions. Thank you. Over Yotin. to you, Madhavi. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions here on inflation, and maybe I can request Abdul to start. Um, Abdul, the question here is that what does high inflation and high commodity prices mean for the people in developing countries? So how should we understand these forecasts? And possibly a related question is, uh, does the reopening of the PRC have anything to do with this higher inflation? Okay, thank you for those questions. Um, let me start with the second one. Um, so. PRC reopening, first, it's just getting started, um, and it may, you know, depending on how strong it is, it, it may put upward pressure on global commodity prices, because China is one big consumer of uh, a lot of key commodities, and a lot of it depends on 
uh, the nature of the recovery in China. And uh, so it, yeah, whether it's, let's say, investment-led or consumption-led. But so as, as we're seeing it, it it's not yet, it, it's not a factor that would drive up inflation, but it there is that upside risk depending on how strong that recovery is. Um, what, but again, remember the context, inflation is actually on the decline already. So let me take the the first the other question then like how how do you think about it if you're you know for for ordinary Joes in the street um, what does this mean so so the the numbers we present here are headline inflation forecasts and they uh, yeah th this these are the measures that uh, countries use they they measure. Uh, the price rises for a broad basket of commodities. Now, food and energy inflation tends to be different, and um, yeah, the, uh, and, and it can be higher. And for if you think about uh, people at the lower uh, end of the income spectrum, they may spend more of their budget on food and on energy, uh, and, uh, and therefore they may feel more of the impact. So the, the um, one key is to remember one, one key that uh, for policymakers to remember is to definitely focus on uh, the inflation that uh, that the lower income households are feeling, and therefore if if it if it's pinching their 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 budgets and eating into their incomes, this is an area where, for example, targeted subsidies might be worthwhile, but not general blanket subsidies which would actually, much of it would actually go to higher income households. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Would anyone like to come in with a regional perspective? Oh, sure. I mean, of course, you know, when we talk about inflation and so on, generally, if uh, inflation were driven more by, you know, um, uh, commodity prices, such as fuel and so on, uh, you see that countries with lower level income, where a disproportionate, much higher amount of the share income is, uh, you know, uh, from uh, food and uh, fuel, the inflation will, you know, impact will be, you know, hitting the hardest. And we saw like this week recently that, you know, OPEC is further, you know, uh, reducing its uh, oil supply. So that is likely to have an impact. And this will actually translate more into a bigger impact on the, uh, on the country where uh, generally, the poorer segment of the population, which of course are much more, uh, where the bigger amount of the consumption basket is uh, devoted to food and uh, fuel. Uh, and I guess, you know, how can we, you know, uh, probably, I guess, you know, a lot of countries use a subsidy, which is you know, generally not the best way, and it costs, and it's very costly, and you give uh, subsidized uh, people who don't really need the subsidy. So the solution might be sort of a more, much more targeted assistance uh, to support the people who are um, least able to deal with the impact of the higher prices. I'll stop here. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, we have a very popular question here, and uh, let me request James to come in. How will the RCEP impact on ASEAN as a whole, and in particular on the Philippines? Will it make a difference to the development prospects for ASEAN? Thank you, Madhavi, for the question. And RCEP is really a very important agreement for the region. I think the main anticipated impact of RCEP is its ability to manage some of the challenges provided by multiple free trade agreements in the region. And it can also help further liberalize economic cooperation. In particular, it can provide better access for trading goods uh, as it holds many of the product-specific rules of origins across many FTAs, because you know the region has a lot of bilateral FTAs. So what this RCEP will do is it, it will fold the rules of origin. It promises to uh, develop a single RCEP originating product, and that would actually reduce the cost of trade a lot. I, I think the third impact, possible impact of RCEP is actually, uh, there are three important chapters there. One is the chapter on e-commerce, which we have seen is really a very important uh, source of growth. Uh, there's also the chapter on investment, which also opens up uh, uh, services sector for investment in the region, and also the, the chapter on trade and services. I think these new chapters uh, will really uh, further liberalize um, 
uh, trading services, which is a, a very important sector for the region. Back to you, Madabi. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I want to take a question on, uh, well, PRC mainly. Um, so, Akiko, there is a question here that says that a recent report from the World Bank suggests a serious concern on population dynamics, uh, especially after COVID-19, um, such as smaller birth rate in China. Does this have an immediate impact on growth or inflation? Um, thank you, Madabi. Um, so this is a uh, this is an area that it's been ongoing. It's not new. Uh, China is an aging uh, country. Um, uh, population growth uh, has turned uh, or labor force growth uh, is now turned a negative, and it's a great concern for us. Um, does it have an impact? Uh, immediate impact? It has been having an impact already. And um, if you look at ADO chapter of ours for PRC in the final section on policy challenges, we do talk about uh, potential uh, growth in the next decades. And that's where we discuss uh, in depth about uh, demographic challenges, um, which, which will actually drag the potential growth of the country. And um, so, the country has taken some measures. Uh, quite recently, uh, they uh, they are proposing to be implemented quite shortly, uh, hopefully, is that they are trying to delay uh, the retirement age for the female uh, labor force. Uh, so those steps are being taken, but still uh, beginning and initial steps. And we hope to, um, uh, see this more often in various areas in demographic um, transition for this country. And for any uh, detailed uh, discussions, uh, uh, please have a look at this, uh, our study, which is already available as a working uh, paper as well. Thank you. Thank you, Akiko. While I still have you on the screen, maybe I can just talk to you about another ongoing issue, which is the US-China trade tensions and maybe your thoughts on this. Yes, so on this one, um, I think uh, we know that in the past two years, the trade volumes have in actually increased quite a lot, uh, particularly in 2021 and also 2022 before the global demand for goods from China have somewhat moderated. So the relationship between the two countries uh, remains strong. And I think we, we do expect this to continue. Um, having said that, we are also aware that some of the um, companies in China have shifted their factories into our neighboring countries. Um, so that did um, um, have some impacts in terms of trade dynamics around this area, but uh, the country is aware and uh, we are also proposing to take some measures on uh, further relaxation opening of the FDI area and also uh, promoting um, investment in the basic research uh, and development. And they should hopefully uh, um, encourage more investments into the country going forward. And that's how we see it at this time. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Akiko. Uh, uh, let's add, go ahead. Uh, add a bit on that. I mean, so for, uh, uh, Akiko points to the fact that you know trade remains strong and continues to grow. And because uh, apart from that, FDI, if you also look at FDI flows into China from they, they, it, 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 con it continues to be strong. Again, just to emphasize this fact that sometimes if you look at policymaker, you know, rhetoric from politicians or the news flow, you might get the impression that. Uh, that things are already de are, are 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 decoupling, but that's that's not the case. So both uh, uh, the economic ties remain strong, and even also within the region, um, you know, there's uh, uh, strengthening intra-regional ties. The other point that Akiko made was about um, the move again, sort of a uh, the move of production out of China and into other countries. Vietnam being one of the uh, main beneficiaries. So yes, that's occurring. We have to remember that that's part of 
something that that trend had already been happening even prior to the tensions over the, that that uh, that we've seen in the, in recent years and a, a large part of it is because china as it has become very successful incomes has incomes have risen and so low cost assembly which used to be you know uh, the uh, there used to be a big advantage doing it there it's less advantageous to do it there so uh, that process obviously now accelerates because many firms also don't want to be uh, to be too exposed and want to diversify their production basis thank you thank you can i also add a bit madam go this ahead very, james uh, we've done uh, in a, a recent book we've launched last 30 march we've done simulations on this geopolitical tension we've implemented three types of a response one is uh, near shoring the other one is reshoring and then the other one is French shoring and in all these three simulations, what, 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 what's apparent is the, that the impact on income, global income, is negative. So, for instance, for reshoring, it has the biggest negative impact of about 1.2% of global income wiped out. Uh, Nearshoring actually wipes out around 0.9% of global income. And, and, and French shoring, uh, which is mostly happening, happening in the ASEAN Plus 3 region, uh, wipes out around 0.6%. And in that book, our approach is that really strengthening regional cooperation, particularly within Southeast Asia and also across different subregions, is the best, I think, counterweight to this uh, increasing tension. That's all, Madhavi. Thanks. Thank you for all the responses. Uh, I'm going to turn the discussion a little bit to another issue that's on our minds. Uh, maybe Yotin can start off on how uh, would the banking turmoil in US and Europe affect Asia? Thanks, Madhavi. Uh, that's a very important question. So the, as far as our region is concerned, uh, the exposure to the banking turmoil in the US and Europe uh, uh, has been so far uh, limited. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, the market indicators, um, the banking the sector uh, stock indices, uh, for the first two weeks of March, uh, we will see that uh, the banking sector uh, stock prices in the, our region uh, declined by 4%, around 4%. Uh, this is small compared to the, the decline in the US, the close to 20%, and uh, in Europe, the, uh, about 14 to 15%. So that, that, that is uh, market responses to the banking turmoil. And uh, it, it reflects that um, uh, the banking sector in, in Asia uh, is still uh, relatively sound and uh, robust. Uh, um, um, and also when, when we look closely into the, um, uh, the health of the banking sector uh, in our region, uh, we find that the uh, uh, banking sector in Asia is well capitalized uh, compared to the banking sector in the other regions. So that is another good element to have um, uh, for our financial system. Now, going forward though, um, although there is a low probability that um, what happened in the uh, US and Europe uh, will spread uh, into the wider problem, um, the, the problem uh, with the SVB um, and Credit Suisse uh, were, were nothing like uh, what we observed during the GFC. And uh, we, we, we expect a uh, really low probability that uh, it will become like one. Um, but, um, the low probability is the, uh, still um, some probability. Um, and uh, if, if, uh, if uh, the problem get uh, uh, to, to spread uh, in, in, into the wider problem, then, uh, that, that would, of course, uh, would increase the, the risk aversion. Uh, it could affect the, the volatility of the capital flows, uh, which could affect the um, financial market in the region. So the, we should uh, closely uh, monitor um, this uh, banking sector problem in the US and uh, Europe. Uh, let me stop here uh, in case my colleagues have. Yeah, James, would you like yes, to come James. in? Yes, um, just a very quick point. I think uh, there are two types of contagion that the region is quite uh, familiar with. One of the uh, critical uh, contagion effect is actually the stop and reversal. I don't think stop and reversal would happen in this case. But I think there's a specific type of contagion, which we call the slow burn contagion, which is quite likely, but it will happen over the, the medium term. So basically, the slow burn contagion it comes from the fact that uh, most of the primary lenders in the region are quite correlated. So what happens when there is a shock, 
is that over time, and we've seen this during the GFC, uh, many of the foreign lenders, primary lenders in the re region, they leverage. They're unable to, to, to provide the needed credit. And that actually tightens our ability to access foreign funds. And given that the region's uh, infrastructure needs are quite large, this is actually quite worrisome for us. For example, for, for Southeast Asia, uh, we're anticipating impact, of course, on, on, on Lao PDR, which has uh, some issues on the debt. Uh, we're, we're also anticipating some, some, some difficulty for Vietnam, which are now uh, experiencing some financial financial stress. And, and of course, Indonesia, which is quite also reliant on equity flows and also some debt levels. So I think this low-born contagion is what uh, policymakers should be vigilant. And, and we should use our financial policy to ensure that macro prudential and micro prudential policies are in place to ensure that this doesn't uh, contribute to any bank run in the region. Thank you, Madabi. Uh, Bernard, did you want to comment further? Sure. Uh, I would like to take a different sort of uh, perspective. So I think so far our panelists uh, have thought about you know, the potential for uh, um, contagion or transmission of the shock from the uh, US and Europe into the region. But I think uh, another lesson that one could take from this uh, recent banking turmoil is that uh, deposits are becoming much less stable. So one of the traditional, uh, how should we say, belief in banking is, you know, Deposits are the most stable form uh, of you know, whatever uh, uh, liability for the bank, right? Deposits, people don't tend to move. But I think, you know, um, as we have done more digitalization and also uh, which makes, you know, how should we say, deposits much more easily, you know, uh, you, it's very easy, it's much more easier now to take money out from a bank and move it to another bank if for whatever reason there's a concern about a particular bank. Uh, so that's all one of the things that we saw that happened in uh, SVB. So I think one of the things that we have to start thinking is, you know, uh, deposit may not be that stable. And given the rise of the sort of uh, social media, which can be allow the spread of uh, 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 fear about bank run very quickly, uh, those combined are very important to pose a risk to the banking system. I'll stop here. So I just want to say that you know, another lesson, not just for the transmission, but the nature of banking itself may have been. Interesting. Yutin, you have your hand raised. Thanks, Madhavi. Uh, thanks for that. That's, uh, that's really uh, good and important point. Uh, but I just want to add uh, that uh, in our report, uh, in ADO report, we also have uh, an analysis on the um, uh, what, what would happen if uh, uh, there's a credit tightening? Uh, let's say that uh, if uh, the, the problem in the banking sector in the US and Europe uh, get worsened and there's a credit tightening, um, uh, let's say that the size, uh, half the size of uh, tightening during the GFC, what would happen uh, to growth um, uh, in say the US and also in the diplomat Asia. And we found that um, uh, the, the magnitude of uh, this negative shock on the growth um, would be about, if, if this shock happened sometime in the second quarter of this year, and, and hopefully this is not going to happen, uh, but if it happens, um, it would affect growth in the US to about a, a 0.5 percentage point uh, this year and 1.5 percentage point next year. Um, for our region though, the, the effect would be much smaller. Uh, the effect this year would be around uh, a quarter of a percentage point, and the next year will be about a half a percentage point. Um, so the, we, we also done the, a sort of um, a scenario analysis on if uh, this happened, uh, what would be the effect? And we found that uh, uh, the effect is relatively uh, small so far. Thanks so much, Madhubi. Indeed, there is a lot of analysis in the report and uh, the link is posted in the chat. So please do check it out. Um, I want to take a question here that's uh, maybe a little outside the purview of the ADO usually, but since uh, there are a lot of likes, maybe Abdul, if you could take this. Um, what in general is ADB's view regarding engaging in sovereign wealth funds? Sure, thanks very much. Um, again, uh, the sovereign wealth funds do have their purpose. Uh, as the name implies, there has to be a source of wealth that is enriching, you know, that uh, that um, uh, which which would fund 
which which would which would be the source of funds. And the purpose of the sovereign wealth fund is to save for future generations. So the the you know uh, sort of best practice example that uh, people often hold is uh, Norway when they discovered oil in the North Sea. Uh, they they knew that th this this will not it, it doesn't continue forever, and you don't want to so you want to ensure that uh, the resources or the revenues generated are spread evenly across generations, not just for uh, today's generation, but for you know uh, for future generations. So there is a purpose, and, and uh, ADB uh, has supports um, uh, this when it's co correct. Uh, one, you, if you look at the Papua New Guinea country chapter in the current Asian Development Outlook, it precisely talks about operationalizing an SWF for Papua New Guinea, which has. Uh, uh, which is also a resource economy. And the key elements there are, you, again, sort of it has to be well designed, has to be well governed. Uh, what's the source of funding? And how do you ensure uh, that that it's it's a well run sovereign wealth fund? Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Um, there's a question here. And if James would like to come in on the important role of green, blue, and in general impact financing, and what that has what role that has to play in um, mobilizing capital to catalyze growth and development in general, would you like to comment? Yes, thank you, Madabi. This is a very important question, especially in Southeast Asia, the imperatives for uh, responding to climate risk is quite large. In, in Southeast Asia, uh, I think a forthcoming ADB study shows that GDP losses could amount to almost 30% uh, by 2100. Presently, 2022, the direct cost of carbon calculated at $180 per ton is around $306 billion. And uh, catalyzing uh, green and blue finance is actually one of, uh, one of the biggest initiatives that we have in, in so the Southeast Asia Regional Department. We have the energy transition mechanism we have the Asian Catalytic Green Finance. And these are actually platform where we use and leverage uh, philanthropic money, private sector capital, development finance to actually provide credit enhancement to the risk projects and sometimes even provide project preparation capability so that these green and blue finance projects becomes commercially viable for the private sector. And, and this, this is good for gro growth recovery because we know that green projects actually generate more jobs than fossil fuel related projects. If we look at the investment pool, for example, of investment in renewable energy, ramping up investment in renewable energy, the estimate for the region is there's an investment pool per year of about 170 billion. So indeed, I think catalyzing green and blue finance is quite important for economic recovery, particularly in Southeast Asia. Back to you, Madabi. Thank you, James. I want to circle back to an issue that I promised, which is on debt. Uh, maybe Bernard, you can start with South Asia and some of the countries that are facing um, deteriorating debt analytics and maybe others can come in as well later. Yeah, so for sure, I think the, you know, the, the situation we see many countries facing like debt problems. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, Sri Lanka, it's just, uh, you know, uh, Started an IMF program to sort of uh, bring this uh, uh, that level down. So going ahead, I think we do see several uh, challenges on this front, right? So for one, interest rate is uh, getting uh, higher. So the cost of servicing debts, either those that already you know there's a floating debt or the countries are uh, uh, refinancing is going to be uh, getting tighter. And as we mentioned before, the impact of the banking turmoil, there seems to be a general perception that the financial actual assets are becoming more risky. So again, uh, maybe extra risk premium in addition to whatever the risk-free rate has uh, been higher. So going ahead, cost of debt is going to be increasing, which further puts a, 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 a how should we say, um, further extra burden on the, on the, on the country to already have a higher level of debt. So I think it's really important for a country to start, uh, how should we say, looking at ways to both uh, reduce, you know, to sort of uh, find ways to sort of uh, reduce their debt burden. Uh, so this could be done through, you know, finding ways to increase domestic resource mobilization and at the same time rationalizing uh, expenditure. So, you know, I think, you know, I think, uh, a few issues of the ADO goal, there was a strong emphasis on the need to 
uh, remove many of the untargeted subsidy and focus more on the targeted subsidy, which will provide social safety nets and also bring down overall. So better protect the citizen than necessary to protect and at the same time reduce the overall cost of uh, expenditure on the government. And for many countries where you know uh, the tax you know uh, rate is very low, some countries have below ten percent GDP, which is much lower than what a country should be able to. They really need to look at ways to improve domestic resource mobilization. So that is going to be a challenge, and we really need to solve look at the country to help them with the domestic resource mobilization and rationalizing the expenditure while at the same time maintaining the necessary social safety net. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Yotin, would you like to comment on the region in general in this issue? Yes, uh, just want to add that um, when we think about the debt issues, um, uh, is is uh, as the Bernard uh, mentioned, uh, um, the public debt is one, um, but uh, the debt uh, vulnerabilities uh, can be also be a combination uh, of uh, debt in the various sectors, um, the household debts, the private sector debt, corporate debts, and the public debts. And uh, if you look across the countries, the, uh, we see the pockets of uh, fragilities uh, coming from the household debt uh, uh, from some countries. Um, private sector uh, driven by, for example, um, more recently the um, real estate markets um, in the several. Um, so um, I think that when we think about uh, the, um, the debt service, the, uh, one, one can also think uh, in terms of uh, the, the comprehensive picture uh, across the sectors, uh, what, what happened to the sectoral debts uh, in the economies. Yeah. Thank you, Yosin. Stop here. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, since we are coming to the end of the hour, I'd like to ask this question maybe first to Akiko and if others would like to reply as well. What is the most foreseeable risk uh, which will give a negative impact to you know, PRC in the next year and of course in general to the Asia and Pacific region? So I'll start, Madhavi. Um, Go ahead. So this is a negative risk. As I said, uh, to our economic outlook, the largest one is a positive, uh, positive side risk uh, with uh, quicker than uh, expected recovery in the consumption. But on the negative side, um, uh, I think it's the policy stance um, that may drag uh, the recovery of uh, investment, particularly in the private sector, which has been uh, weak uh, coming back. Um, and the private sector uh, creates jobs uh, for, for, for fifth of the job in the urban area. And that's, that's the core and uh, crucial element supporting the uh, recovery this year. And government is, uh, is taking measures to support the particularly smaller businesses to create jobs. But um, if that doesn't materialize, that would be the major risk uh, providing negative uh, side risk. Over to you, Madhavi. Thank you. Can I turn this over to Abdul for a few comments? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, a great question to, to end uh, if, this, if this will be the final question. When I look at it, um, if I had to choose like one risk Again, we, we highlight many, and uh, um, if I had to highlight one, it sort of ties in a lot of the elements we've been discussing this past hour. And it's basically this idea of heightened financial stability risks. It really has to do with the fact that debt across many sectors, as Yotin mentioned, rose over the past 10, 15 years because of very low borrowing costs. But now you have an environment of higher borrowing costs and interest rates and that is really heightening these vulnerabilities. Plus, if you add on the fact that when you have asset, uh, you know, uh, booms uh, in in let's say in in property, uh, then th all of these elements really make for dangerous situations. So while overall, you know, you uh, as Yotin mentioned, you know, the ba many banking sectors are healthy. There will be pockets of vulnerability, not just so both in within the region. Um, 
Bernard had talked about, you know, uh, some some uh, sovereigns or governments which are having uh, problems of uh, financing their or you know, uh, you know financing their debts. But then there are some uh, private sectors uh, in the region, Cambodia being one, where uh, private sector debt is high. So we need policymakers just need to watch out for these because it is a much tougher environment. Then of course there are the uh, risks. This is it's not just a regional issue. This is a global issue. And so we also have to keep an eye out for financial stability risks emanating from outside the region. Thanks. Thank you, Abdul. And with that, indeed, we will have to end the webinar and panel discussion. We've really had a very exciting discussion on recovery, growth, and uncertainties in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you to Abdul and the panelists for navigating us through this discussion today. Thanks also to you, our audience, for your active participation today. Please visit adb.org for the detailed report of the Asian Development Outlook 2023. I am also pleased to mention that the ADO 2023 thematic report titled Asia in the Global Transition to Net Zero will be launched on 27th April.